This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome you to worship this Sunday morning at First Presbyterian Church in North Palm Beach. Um, what an opportunity we have to continue to worship together in this different medium. You know, good news, we've, we have about 1,500 folks joining us in worship on Sunday mornings in both of our services, in the traditional and in the way service. That's a pretty, that's a pretty encouraging number. So thank you all who continue to tune in. Um, and those of you who are members of our church, welcome. And those of you who have found us online and are joining us uh, in worship, welcome. Uh, it's a great thing to be together uh, in our homes on Sunday mornings. This morning, the call to worship comes from Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol I laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish, then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. church family Josh here with my wife Taylor and uh, many of you guys know us you've seen us around but uh, we are we serve at First Pres we've been at First Pres for um, almost three years now and I am serving in a residency program with First Pres I'm currently in seminary doing my Master's of Divinity at Palm Beach Atlantic University and I have completed all four of my apprenticeships with you all and so you've given me a lot of opportunities to serve and get experience and uh, basically I help uh, with the way service, I help with uh, small groups, and really anything else that Ron tells me to do, I listen to Ron and uh, take my direction from him. And so we love serving. Taylor actually serves in many different ways too as well. Yeah, I have the privilege of running all the social media for the church, so I love that. And then I also serve on the missions committee with Josh, and I also, like Josh said, volunteer on a multitude of different teams over at the Way Service every weekend. 
Yeah, so Ron just kind of asked us to share a little bit about our experiences in ministry kind of through this season. Obviously, we're brand new to ministry. Uh, we are um, going through this season trying to figure out how to do ministry in the context of a pandemic. And so we are taking our cues from those above us. But Ron wanted us to share just a little bit about uh, the things that God has been teaching us as we continue to try to do ministry um, throughout this season. And I think that uh, something that we've been talking about lately is uh, when you're kind of going through this process um, of trying to do ministry over virtual means and, and uh, trying to reach people uh, through technology, you know, it gets kind of hard and difficult that we think that, you know, how can you preach the Word of God over technology or how can you cultivate community over uh, Zoom? Um, but it's all these things that we're now forced to do. And I think something that we've really learned is that uh, it's really forced us to think about the, the vastness and the, um, the grandness of God's Spirit and His power to be able to be with you in your home, uh, wherever you're watching services from, wherever you're leaning in and worshiping from. Uh, a couple weeks ago in one of our way services, uh, I, I saw this, uh, this post on social media and they said that the church has left the building. And I thought that was just kind of a neat way to put it, that um, the church is not set up for God's presence to be confined in those four walls. Uh, but that God's presence is everywhere that we go. And and something that we've just been learning is as we lean into the worship services, as we join in on small groups and and uh, podcasts and things like that, is that God's spirit can be with us in our home, in our living room, in the car. And it's forced us to think about how do we, how do we listen to his guidance and his direction outside of the church. I think that sometimes it's easy to kind of silo worship to be the church building and that when we need to get like our worship fixed, we can go to church and that's the place to do it. But but oftentimes in our home, uh, it's the place of security. It's the place where we can kind of just be vulnerable and open. Uh, sometimes it's the place where we kind of have the dark side of a show a little bit. Uh, but now that our home is also a place of worship. And so maybe just like from our home to yours, we, we've been learning and God's been teaching us that how do we make our home a place that glorifies God? How do we make our home a place that worships God uh, in different ways than we hadn't thought of before? Um, and maybe, I don't know, Taylor, you want to maybe just talk about how like we've been trying to do that in our home? Yeah, well, we've set up the TV with the way service every Sunday, so that's how we watch it. And we make sure we just prepare our hearts and really act like it was a live service. So we get our journals, we get our Bibles before the countdown even starts leading up to the service, and we make sure we're ready for worship and then for the Word. And another thing we just love doing is Zooming our friends, just keeping up with that community like Josh was saying, and just checking in with people, praying for people over the phone. There's lots of different ways, I think, that we found that you could be ministering to people during this time and also just receiving. So mm -hmm. we've been... Um, really appreciating like everything that this season is bringing. And on that note, we just want to encourage you right now in your homes to just allow joy to enter your homes, mm -hmm. allow peace to enter your homes, allow God to come in and bring his presence in your home um, in ways that he never has before. And um, we're just praying for you that the joy of the Lord is your strength during the season. I think that mm -hmm. that's what God wants for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's his plan for us and just to see the positive and the light at the end of the tunnel. So we're praying for you guys. And we love you, and we hope that this testimony was um, helpful to you. Mm. And we'll see you again, hopefully in person soon. Yeah, take care. May the Lord show his mercy upon you. May the light of his presence be your God. uphold you. May his spirit be ever by your side. When you sleep, may his angels watch over you.
loving kindness around you, keep you safe as you journey on your each new day. May he bless all your loved ones and cherish them. Every friend, every stranger at your door. In thy name of his son, Please join me in prayer. O oh, Almighty God, who raised Jesus Christ from death to life, where he sits at your right hand and will come again to judge the world, we give you great and hearty thanks for the resurrection of Jesus and for the hope that it gives us. We give you praise and thanks for the blessings we observe around us, that you have provided medical professionals who are caring for the sick, that you have been extending the supplies and the skill of our doctors and nurses, that you have been bringing healing to many. God, we come to with things that we need to confess before you. You are a holy, generous, and loving God, and we are not holy people. We come and we confess that we need your forgiveness. We have not loved you as we ought to, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Please forgive us and make us new. Lord God, around us there are so many places and situations where we see the need of your help. We ask for your comfort for those who are grieving in Canada after the shooting last week. We ask for your comfort for those who are grieving losses of family members and friends to coronavirus. We ask for your provision for those who are struggling financially, who may be out of work, or who are struggling to find enough food to feed their families. We ask for your protection and care for all those who are caring for the sick, and that you might give them stamina and courage in this difficult time. And God, we lift up families Families that are caring for their children and helping them to do school as well as doing, as the parents doing their own work. We ask that they might know your presence, your joy and your peace among them. God, this is a difficult and strange time. So many things are so unusual for us every day. We ask that you might break up the hardness of our hearts, that you might give us eyes to see what you are doing. Help us to welcome the new things that you are bringing, even as we grieve our losses. And finally, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. service, we have the opportunity to consider how we can give back to God, to the work of his kingdom through the work of First Presbyterian Church in North Palm Beach. You have the opportunity to send your contributions by mailing in a check, going to the website, or texting. All of those options will be listed at the end of the service. But I would just ask you to think about what God has done for you and all the ways he has been generous. And consider it a joy and a privilege to give back a portion of that to him. 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him of all the earthly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy invite you to get your Bibles and turn to our scripture passage today, which is from 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 13 to 23. This morning's sermon is actually for both the way service and the traditional service. Now, at the way service, we started this series in 1 Peter last week, so let me give you a little background. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, is writing to Christians, to followers of Jesus, who are in churches scattered throughout Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey in that region. And he's writing to these followers of Jesus who are being persecuted, they're suffering, and they're feeling very disconnected from the world that they're living in. They really aren't fitting in with the culture around them. In a sense, they are homeless. They have no home. And so Peter is writing to offer encouragement to them. He wants to help them to have faith that endures. He wants them to remain steadfast and faithful and obedient to God. Reading through this letter is amazing. For Peter writes with these deep, rich nuggets of wisdom. You can't just easily skim it or read it quickly. For every word that you're uh, taking in has this deep, rich meaning. It's like having a bowl of sea glass. The sea glass are pieces that Catherine and I have found as we have walked along the beach. And and this bowl is filled with pieces of glass that are colorful and that are amazingly beautiful. And it's like you kind of pick through the glass and you find one that you want to look at and you hold it up and you um, just look at the beauty and the color and you reflect on this. And that's what reading through 1 Peter is like. You read along and you paused because you found a nugget of wisdom that strikes home that you want to think about. And then you read a little further and you pause because you found another nugget, a word from God that sinks deep into your heart. And so you reflect on it. And then you read a little bit more and you find another nugget in First Peter. And, and so, so First Peter is to be traversed slowly and thoughtfully and reflect, reflecting, pausing to reflect and, and taking time to think about it. One aspect of 1 Peter that is important for us is that Peter weaves throughout his whole letter, and especially in chapter 1, the theme of hope. He wants these Christians who are suffering and who are persecuted and feeling disconnected. He wants them to have hope. And so he writes how God has given them this new life, how they've been born again. It's a gift of God from his mercy. It's nothing that they have done, but purely from God, he has showered upon them grace and new life. And because of this, they have now a living hope, a confident expectation of the life to come. An inheritance, he says, that is secured for them in heaven and that is guarded and watched over by God. 
And because it's an inheritance that's secured, nothing is going to happen to it. It's not going to be decaying. It's not going to be defiled. It's not going to fade. This hope that Peter is writing about is secure, and it's to be counted on, and it's to be reflected on, and it, our eyes are to be looking to this hope that we have that God has given us. I was speaking with one of our ministry partners this week. I invited her to Zoom and teach my class at PBA. And I asked her to speak on the topic of discipleship and suffering. How do those two things go together? And so she was sharing about the ministry leaders that she works with that are being persecuted, that are in prison, that are under threat. And as she reflected on the things that she has learned from these disciples who endure suffering on an everyday basis, one of the things she reflected on that matters to them is that they have what she called an eschatological hope, a hope for the future, a hope for when Christ returns. And she said that the, the ministry leaders that she works with cling to this hope of the future and that it matters to them. It is a very real part of their faith. And then she reflected that we in the U.S. or in the West, that this eschatological hope really isn't something we think about very often. We're more present oriented. We are more in the now. And what a great reminder that Peter gives us that this hope that we have in the future is something that we can cling to confidently and it is what encourages us today and it is what helps us to endure obediently in our following of Jesus. So I now invite you to listen as I read God's word starting in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13. And Peter writes, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and your hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. So now that Peter has written for us, about all these things that God has done for us, he then turns to a series of exhortations. You could think of them as commands or imperatives. Based on what God has done, how should we respond? And so he begins to list some of these for us to think about. I'm gonna just briefly touch on a few. 
the first thing he says is because of what God has done in giving us this gift of new life and this inheritance that we have, he reminds us that we are to set our hope on the grace that will be revealed when Jesus Christ comes. And in essence, he's exhorting us and commanding us to set our hope, to refocus our vision, to look ahead to what God has promised for us when Jesus Christ returns again. He's reminding us that in the midst of all that we're going through, in the midst of quarantine, in the midst of a pandemic that is global, in the midst of financial difficulties, in the midst of not being connected to family and to people that we love, we are to make sure that our hope, our confident expectation of God's promises of life to come, that that undergirds everything that we are experiencing right now. He reminds us that this hope is a gift of grace that we can look forward to when Jesus comes again. He then talks about how we're to live together. He says we're to be holy because God is holy. We're to be set apart and in a, in a way we are to be used by God. We'll talk more about this in future sermons to come in this series. And then he kind of has this really interesting exhortation to us. He says, since we call on a father who judges each person impartially, that we are to live out our time as foreigners here on the earth in reverent fear. Now, he's not talking about that we're to be afraid of God, that we're to be anxious about God, that we're to kind of cower and, and be very tentative in our relationship. He says, to begin with, that since we call on a father, and the, the verb here has this sense of calling over and over and over again. It's a highlight of our relationship with God. He says we're a fa he's our father, so that means that we are adopted children. And in this relationship with our father, we have this ongoing conversation, prayer, where over and over and over again, we're calling on him. So he reminds us, first of all, that we have this intimate, loving relationship with a father who has adopted us as his children. But then he says, this father who loves you and you are close with also is an impartial judge. And he is going to impartially judge all of our lives and the pattern of our lives and how we've lived our lives. And so because of this, he exhorts us to live in what he calls a reverent fear. Now, what this is talking about is a deep respect on one hand. We are to have this deep respect, this reverence, if you will, of who our Father really is. He is a holy God of Israel. He is the one who will judge us impartially. And so because of that, he also, as a father who loves us, uh, commands reverence and commands respect. And there should be this healthy balance with a father who is willing to discipline us and test us, uh, a father who is a holy, a father who judges, that is to be balanced with um, this idea of a father that we can talk to over and over and over again. He doesn't want us to take advantage of God's grace in our lives. I think in some respects he's uh, writing to exhort this deep reverence, this, this reverent fear 
so that we don't take God's grace for granted. So that we don't think, well, God loves me, so I can do whatever I want. Or, well, I know I'm breaking um, the way that God wants me to live, but I can just ask him for forgiveness and he'll forgive me. Peter wants us to have this deep, abiding respect and, and awe and what he calls a reverent fear of God. You know, as I was thinking about this this week, as I was reading uh, about this and reflecting on this closeness versus this um, holy father who's enthroned in the heavens, I mean, this may seem a little odd to you, but it made me think of when I was a young boy and I was taking swimming lessons at the Howard Park Pool in West Palm Beach. And every summer we would go, and, and this is kind of how it worked, that we would get there a little bit early, we would go through the, the dressing room and walk through the chlorine foot washer pool, and then we would go out into the, the pool and we'd be swimming around until it was time for swimming lessons to start. And then the teacher, I don't even remember his name, but he was this large man who was tan from being out in the sun and he would walk out of the dressing room with a pith helmet on and a whistle around his neck and, and when you saw him walk out you knew it was time for swimming lessons to start and he would go to the edge of the pool and he would blow his whistle and everything would stop. And there would be a, a silence that would sweep across the pool. For the teacher was here. And then he would take his pith helmet and he would throw it across the pool. And it would land in the water. And then he would dive and swim underwater all the way to where the helmet was floating. And he would come up and the helmet would be located on his head. And I don't know, there was something about that that just struck fear and awe in the heart of a young boy who was waiting to take swimming lessons. We knew that he loved us and that he cared about us. We knew that if we swam to him, he would catch us and that he wanted to teach us. But we also knew on some level that this wasn't an instructor that you would mess around with, that this wasn't someone that you would flippantly uh, disobey. He commanded fear while he loved us. And I think that's what Peter is talking about here. And the reason that God can command this kind of fear and love and respect and nearness is because Peter reminds us that he has redeemed us. Now, redemption, back in uh, the day that Peter is writing, actually had to do with when a slave who was owned by another person could either purchase himself or someone else could purchase his freedom. And so the owner would be paid a certain amount and the slave would then be redeemed. What Peter is saying that God is the one who has redeemed us. And it hasn't been this um, redemption with gold or silver that are, we see as being incredibly valuable, but the redemption was made by the precious blood of Jesus. And because of that, it is different than gold and silver that will perish. Our redemption by the blood of Jesus is imperishable. And so now we belong to God. Now that gives us hope because whatever it is we go through, whatever suffering or struggles that we go through in life, that, that the fact that we belong to God, that, that is what gives us hope. And that our redemption, the purchase of ourselves from a life of sin, an empty life, into a life of purpose and meaning, that purchase was made by the blood of Jesus. 
And then he goes on to say the next exhortation is that we are to love one another. Now, what he's talking about, excuse me, I dropped my notes. What he's talking about is that this redemption um, by God leads us to a life of love. Theology, our understanding of who God is and what God has done, always leads to ethics, which is how we live our lives. So here, because we've been purchased, Peter writes twice, because uh, our, our purchase was made with this, um, the blood of Jesus who it doesn't perish, because that's the kind of God that we serve, that we belong to. We now are freed to live a life of love. And so what Peter writes is, you know, our obedience to the word is what cleanses our hearts. And so we know that we are to love each other sincerely with a brotherly love is what he talks about. But then after acknowledging brotherly love, he gives the command that we are to love one another deeply from the heart. It's as if he's saying all of you in the family of God, you've all been redeemed, you've all been um, purchased, you've all been saved from this empty life, and, and this redemption is imperishable. That's the hope that we have. And because we have hope, we are compelled to not just love each other in this brotherly, friendly love, but he says we're to love one another deeply from the heart. Agape love, the kind of love that God has for us, the kind of love that is willing to sacrifice, the kind of love that is willing to serve the other person. Peter is saying that in the Christian community, there is to be a depth of love for each other. It's not an option. It's not something we can say, well, I like that person and not so much that person. Because we've all been redeemed, we are obligated to agape love one another. A deep love. Now, what does that look like today? So, a couple thoughts that I've had. That um, First of all, I, I thought of what Jesus says, um, love one another as I have loved you. He said that to his disciples. So it would cause us to ask the question, how has he loved us? And the answer to that is he has loved us sacrificially. So a deep love, agape love, is a love that is willing to sacrifice. Then um, I was reading, reminded of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book about Christian community called Life Together. And in this book, he has a ministry, or he talks about um, the ministry of love that we are to have for one another, the way that our community is to be shaped. Because our church family is um, connected by Jesus Christ, deep love that Peter is talking about would have perhaps some of these characteristics, this ministry. So Bonhoeffer talks about the ministry of listening. To love one another deeply, he says, means that we would strive to listen to one another. Just as love to God begins with listening to his word, Bonhoeffer writes, so the beginning of love for the brothers and sisters is learning to listen to them. And then he goes on to talk about the importance of listening, and then he ends this paragraph by saying, that so often we forget that listening can be a greater service than speaking. Bonhoeffer talks about the ministry of helpfulness and how we, in little tasks of helpfulness, express our love for one another. And within this, he um, reminds us 
that sometimes love means that we're willing to have our schedules interrupted for our sisters or our brothers. He goes on to talk about the ministry of bearing one another's burdens. And then he comes to the place where he talks about the ministry of the proclamation of the word. And this struck me because in Peter's letter here, he's um, linking um, how we've been purified by the truth of the word of God to loving one another. And Bonhoeffer does an amazing description of what it means to speak God's word to one another. He's not talking about pastors preaching sermons. He's talking about people in the family of God speaking God's word to one another. And um, he talks about the responsibility that we have in loving each other. He says in our deep relationships, there's going to come a time when we must speak God's word of affirmation, of accountability, of admonition. We must speak God's word into one another's life. And I think the examples of listening and of um, helpfulness and of bearing one another's burdens and of speaking the word of God to each other are examples of what it means to love one another deeply. I feel like I've been learning about this in the last month or two months that I've been visiting with Tim. And it has been such a blessing to me to sit with Tim and to think about our ministries that have overlapped almost simultaneously together and to think about how God has called us and, and how God empowered us. And, and I've been struck and blessed by what I would say is this experience of deep love that I've had with Tim as we have had this time to talk together. And it honestly, it has made me think about how much time we've missed through the years because we were busy or because uh, we had too much to do with ministry or we were just living life and I mean we would see each other and we would talk to each other and we would have this interaction with each other but it's when we slow down enough to actually come together and speak about the important things of faith that I have experienced what deep love is like that's what God is calling us to experience within our church family and within um, the larger global church family. Peter says we are to love one another deeply from the heart. Now, that would be my prayer for First Pres in North Palm Beach. And as we think about moving into the future, one of the things that we've thought about is how do we connect in ways that will enable this kind of love to be experienced? And so we are going to embark on some opportunities to connect in some groups and to come together and to begin to experience what this kind of life might be like. So I'm going to encourage you to pray about that. How could you be involved in a community where our priority is to love one another deeply. That is my hope. I think that's what Peter is calling us to. Let's move into the future together. Amen. Before we close in prayer, I'm reminded of how much this church family at First Pres has been loving one another during this time of social distancing and quarantine. I've been hearing all kinds of stories about how you have been calling and checking in with one another, how you have been doing shopping, grocery shopping, and running errands for one another, for how you have been sending emails or texts, phone calls, checking in, all kinds of ways that we have been loving each other. I've also heard that some of you have begun to 
go to the local farms and buy vegetables and fruit and have been sharing those with our church family and also as an outreach, a way to express love for our neighbors. What an amazing opportunity we are living in to live out this command that we are to love one another. When God prompts someone, brings them to mind, call that person and take time to then pray for that person. And as we learn what it means to be a church family that loves deeply, it'll be exciting to see the kinds of connections that we have and what God will do out of uh, rich relationships of heartfelt love. Please join me as we pray. God, thank you for the hope that we have in you for the promises that you have made and how you have stamped and sealed that inheritance through the resurrection of your son and for how he is now seated with you at your right hand in heaven. God, help us set before us this hope that we have in you. And may that enable us to love one another deeply as people who've been redeemed, that we would um, Learn what it means, God, to invest deeply in the lives of each other as you invested deeply in our life. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and fill your hearts with peace. Amen.